Well, hello everyone and welcome back to class. This is Applied Anatomy and Physiology, AAP 301. Technically, this is AAP 302 because in AAP 301, we have the first 12 lectures and then in AAP 302, we have lectures 13 through 224. So today, this is College of Natural Health Sciences, Bermuda. My name is Dr. Delcina Bean Burroughs. This is lecture number 24, and it is the last lecture of the Anatomy and Physiology 301-302 series of lectures. And so today we will be discussing common sports injuries. And in terms of our lecture 24 objectives, at the end of today's lecture, students will be familiar with the common the following common sports injuries, strains and sprains, ACL tears, meniscus tears, labral tears, rotator cuff tears, frozen shoulder, inflammatory injuries such as plantar fasciitis, tennis elbow, Achilles tendon inflammation, shin splints, stress fractures, dislocations, and concussions. And be familiar with general sports injury prevention strategies. Let's begin today's lecture by discussing how sports injuries occur. Sports related injuries can occur as the result of a single traumatic event such as an impact or a fall or from repeated overuse and strain on muscles, tendons, and or ligaments. The mechanism of injury, the MOI, is the force or forces that cause injury when applied to the human body. Forces have characteristics such as speed, size, and direction. Strains and sprains will be the first set of injuries, common sports injuries that we will take a look at. Strains and sprains make up the bulk of sports injuries. Strains happen when muscles or tendons are overstretched or torn. If someone has pulled a muscle, that means they have a muscle strain. The most commonly strained muscles are the hamstrings. Strains are best prevented by proper stretching, strengthening, and proper warm-ups before athletic activity. Sprains happen when ligaments are overstretched or torn. Sprained ankles often happen when a fall or awkward landing from a jump forces the ankle joint to move in an unusual way, stressing or possibly tearing the ligaments surrounding it. Walking, running, or jumping on an uneven surface can also cause a sprained ankle. Stretching, strengthening, and balance exercise as well as supportive footwear can help reduce the risk of ankle sprains. ACL tears or anterior cruciate ligament tears. Many other muscles, tendons, and ligaments frequently tear. ACL anterior cruciate ligament tears tend to happen in sports that put stress on the knees through jumping, sudden stops, and rapid changes in direction. Keeping the strength of the hamstrings and quadricep muscles balanced and practicing safe landing and pivoting techniques can help prevent ACL tears. Here's an interesting fact. Around 55% of sports-related injuries involve the knees. Meniscus tears. The meniscus is a piece of cartilage that cushions the space between the femur and tibia. When a sudden stop or pivot has enough force behind it, the meniscus can tear. The risk of a meniscus tear is particularly high in sports such as football, basketball, or tennis. Increased age also puts athletes at a greater risk for this type of injury. Injury prevention strategies include strengthen the muscles that support and stabilize the knee, wear a brace if you know you have weak or unstable knees, work up slowly to more intense exercise activity, 
and wear athletic shoes that are appropriate for the sport that you are doing. Labral tears. The acetabula labrum is a ring of connective tissue holding the femur in place within the socket of the hip joint, the acetabulum. Frequent pivoting and twisting motions, as well as acute injury to or dislocation of the hip joint can cause this to tear. The risk of a labral tear can be lowered by strengthening the muscles surrounding the hip and not putting one's full weight on the hip joint when the legs are at the extremes of the hips range of motion. Rotator cuff tears. Baseball and tennis players often suffer from rotator cuff injuries, which include tears to the tendon of the supraspinatus muscle. Such tears can occur gradually from repetitive overhead arm motions or as a result of a sudden acute injury. Maintaining balanced muscle strength around the back of the shoulder and the shoulder blade can help reduce the risk of rotator cuff injuries. Frozen shoulder. Sometimes inactivity during the recovery process for an injury, such as a supraspinatus tear, can cause the connective tissue encasing the shoulder joint to become tight and thick. The resulting condition is known as adhesive capsulitis or frozen shoulder. In order to avoid adhesive capsulitis, it is important to coordinate with an osteopath and or a physical and occupational therapist to find exercises that will maintain the shoulder's joint range of motion during the recovery phase. General injury prevention strategies include gentle, progressive range of motion exercises, stretching, and using the shoulder more may help prevent frozen shoulder after surgery or an injury. It is important to note, however, that specialists don't always know what causes some cases of frozen shoulder, and in such cases, it may not be possible to prevent them from occurring. Inflammatory injuries. Inflammation due to repeated activity can result in painful conditions such as bursitis and tendonitis. Bursitis affects the bursi, the small fluid-filled sacs that cushion the shoulders, elbows, hips, knees, and ankles. When there is frequent and intense pressure on the bursi of any of these joints, they can become inflamed. Using knee pads when performing tasks that require kneeling for long periods of time can help reduce the risk of bursitis in the knees. Plantar fasciitis. The plantar fascia connects the heel bone to the toes. Putting stress on this band of tissue can lead to overstretching and the formation of small tears, both of which cause inflammation and pain in the heel and the bottom of the foot. Sports putting a lot of pressure on the heels and professions requiring long hours of standing such as teaching, nursing, retail, culinary, uh, even our profession, uh, carry an increased risk of plantar fasciitis. The best preventive advice is to stay in good shape by maintaining a healthy weight and getting regular exercise. Most importantly, include stretching in your exercise regime because keeping the plantar fascia and calf muscles flexible prevents strain on the ligament. Tennis elbow. Lateral epicondylitis, also known as tennis elbow, occurs when the tendons attaching to the outside of the elbow become inflamed or develop micro tears from repetitive actions common in racket sports such as tennis. Proper stretching and warm up exercises, as well as strengthening the forearm muscles and using power stroke technique can help lower the risk of developing tennis elbow. Achilles tendon inflammation. There are two types of inflammation that can occur on the Achilles tendon. 
tendinitis and tendinosis. Tendinitis happens when there is too much tension on the muscular tendinous unit and micro tears form. Tendinosis is the result of the gradual degradation of the collagen fibers in the muscular tendinous unit. This usually occurs because of chronic overuse. Again, proper warm-ups, stretching, strengthening, and avoiding putting excess stress on the tendons can reduce the risk of injury. Shin splints. Shin splints happen when repetitive and intense impact puts stress on the connective tissue, the periosteum, that attaches the tibia to the surrounding muscles. People with flat feet or high arches have an increased risk of developing shin splints. So do athletes who are returning to intense workouts after a period of inactivity. Supportive footwear with proper arch support and shock absorption can help prevent shin splints. Stress fractures. Stress fractures occur when muscles become fatigued from repeated intense impacts. When they are unable to absorb the shock from these impacts, the role of shock absorber transfers to the bones, leaving them with tiny cracks. Cross-training, wearing supportive shoes, and maintaining a rich diet in calcium and vitamin D can help athletes avoid stress fractures. Dislocations. Dislocations frequently affect joints such as the shoulder and fingers. A dislocated shoulder occurs when sudden impact pops the rounding end of the humerus, either part of the way or all the way, out of the cup-like portion of the scapula. When this happens, the connective tissue holding the humerus in place, which includes the muscles and tendons of the rotator cuff and the glenoid labrum, can tear. Injury prevention strategies include taking care to avoid falls and other shoulder injuries, wearing protective gear when playing contact sports, and exercising regularly to maintain strength and flexibility in muscles and joints. Concussions. Concussions are a form of traumatic brain injury and they are caused by sudden acceleration or deceleration or forceful impacts to the skull. The meninges and cerebral spinal fluid surrounding the brain usually keep it in place, but head trauma can cause the brain to move around and hit the inside of the skull, damaging nerves and blood vessels. If one is suffering from a concussion, it is important not to return to strenuous or risky activities un until instructed to do so by a physician. Injury prevention strategies include limiting the amount of contact during practices, teaching athletes proper techniques and ways to avoid hits to the head, and keeping a close eye on athletes in positions that are, increased, are at increased risk for concussion to help spot a potential concussion from occurring. Okay, so we have reached the end of today's final lecture for AAP 301-302. And so for assignment number 24, I'd like for you to make a chart of the injuries discussed in today's lecture with one column of the chart identifying the injury, one column that describes the injury, and another column that describes injury prevention strategies. And as you see, I provided you with the format that I'd like you to follow for this assignment. And for the deadline in terms of this assignment, it is due on Sunday at 11.55 p.m. However, if you have any difficulty with this assignment, Please don't wait till the last minute. Make sure you give me a, either a call, a text message, or an email. And uh, remember that my office hours, my final office hours for this semester will be on this coming Thursday from 4 to 6 p.m. And 
Yes, so this is, as I mentioned, this is the last and final lecture. So I'd like for you to all feel very proud of yourselves for completing AAP 301, 302. I know that we've covered quite a bit of information in this course, and I know at times it probably seemed like, huh, ah, you know, but uh, you got through it. And of course, anatomy and physiology is a very important part of what we do as osteopathic and naturopathic practitioners. So with that, I want to congratulate you for completing the course. Some of you will be going on to graduate, depending on what program you are in. And so I want to wish you all the very best. And hopefully you will all do well. I'm sure you all will do well on the final exam. Do take care. And I will see you, some of you I will see in other courses and others I will just see you at graduation. Bye.